<laughs> don't think that's a thing anymore. But Megan will take you snipe hunting. What is snipe hunting? <laughs> It's a, it's like a hazing. I mean, not hazing. What? It's innocent, but it's like, it's like an initiation. It's this made up thing called snipes. I think the church actually got rid of it, or at least my stake did. It was so the older hazing. girls take the first years on a hike at night, and they say they're going snipe hunting. And then, without the first years knowing, there's like older girls hiding in the forest, and they'll. <laughs> As the first year's walking by, they'll shake bushes or they'll make noises and and like they won't <laughs> pop out, but they'll be as if there's these crazy, you know, these creepy animals snipes. in the <laughs> What in the world? <laughs> Those are snipes. <laughs> you didn't know how cool we were, did you? Before no you joined idea. the church. You had no I had idea. No idea. I feel like our church is so amazing where we do give opportunities for growth and for leadership to youth to the teenagers and then another part of me is like why are we giving leadership roles to the teenagers and she said well the past few years I, I mean I liked camp but this year I loved it and I said well what made the difference she said well because like I was in charge of girls let's help this next generation just be so awesome if I was born into a family that um, consisted of members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. How would I develop my testimony if my childhood and my teenage years were spent with me being, for lack of a better term, forced to go to church? But I remember as my first year, really looking up to those girls. I don't want to go to church. The talks are boring. And I'll say, well, then don't go for yourself today. Go for somebody else today. Who are you going to try and make smile today? Who are you going to try and be friends to today? Help somebody else have a good time at church. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Ward Radio. We are the women of Ward Radio broadcasting from the Relief Society room today. We have with us Brittany the Shadow. And we have Erica Hansen, wife of Jacob Hansen, who is currently a traitor. She is sitting in the Thoughtful Face studio wearing a Ward Radio shirt. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Jacob's not there, though. <laughs> um, and then we have Megan. And if for any of you who were at General Conference uh, this past April, you may recognize Megan, if you pull up the picture, as the beautiful lady with those incredible boots. So if you saw those boots at conference in April, um, lucky you. <laughs> Thank you. Good to have you with us, Megan. <laughs> Thank you. Happy to be um, here. <laughs> so today we're going to talk um, about youth leading in the church. Some like why it's so powerful to have youth leading in the church and how we can make it happen more. Um, so this has been like I can't stop thinking about this after girls camp last week. So girl, this was my first time at girls camp here uh, in Washington. I grew up in California, and we did girls camp up in the Sierra. Nevada. Sierra Nevada mountains and we were backpacking for most of the time and you went for five years as a camper and then your last year your sixth year you were a YCL youth camp leader so that's just how I grew up with and that's what was normal and awesome for me so when I was invited to do girls camp here they have it set up differently you go to camp for four years and then you're a YCL youth camp leader for like three years you're in this leadership position um, and also that's because now young women, you start when you're 11, not you're 12. So there's there's more years to go to girls camp now. And when I first heard that, I thought, that stinks for those girls. They have to be leaders for, you know, three years. They can't be off having fun. Like when I was a fifth year and we were, you know, rappelling and, and water skiing and horseback riding, like, oh, they just got to stay at camp and lead. Oh, um, so, you know, as what usually happens when you hear something different from what you used to, you roll your eyes, right? So I went to girls camp and it was great. I missed the first couple of days because I was sick. That was a bummer. But when I got there, it was great. And we were closing up camp at the end with the YCLs I was over. And one of them, it was her first year being a YCL. And I said, so what did you think of camp? And she said, well, the past few years, I, I mean, I liked camp, but this year I loved it. And I said, well, what made the difference? She said, well, because like I was in charge of girls. I was in charge of helping them to have a good time. And so I had a good time. And I said, that's awesome. You just experienced like the magic of turning from a receiver to a giver. And that is an amazing moment in anyone's life. And when I'm using these words, 
You're probably, if you pull up that picture of um, the red X and the green check mark, you're probably thinking, oh, the receiver and the giver, like from that book, The Giver, you're the giver now. You're like that old man with the beard passing on everything. Like, no, that's what I'm not, I'm not talking about that. What I'm saying that the transition to a giver is really important. The transition to a giver is when the time in your life when you realize like, it's not all about me, but I'm here to help and to give and to watch out for others. So that's what that picture is. You're not the old man giver from the book, from this utopian society who's passing on memories and feelings. Nope, you are someone, you are the hands of Christ helping others. So that's what I wanted to talk about today. So before I share you know, my thoughts and stories, do you ladies have any experiences either of youth you've seen do that or in times of like when that switch happened to you, when you switched from becoming a receiver to a giver? So floor's open. Okay, well, first off, when you said you're probably thinking of the book, The Giver, I had to be like, well, I actually have never read that book. Same. <laughs> I was like, ah. <laughs> but you well, know what I thought? You've seen that of? cover, right? You've seen that cover. I don't even know if the I have. Guy. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> but I did think of The Giving Tree. I love that oh, yes. book. Yeah. Great book. So that's my so intelligence. You can say that too. You go from a, uh, yeah, you become The Giving Tree. There we yes. go. Well said, Brittany. That book was traumatic. That was, <laughs> I love The Giving Tree, but I had to, I had to <laughs> get over some trauma from reading it for a few years. Your children are going to suck you dry, chop you down. <laughs> like, oh my gosh, like in the end, it's like a stump. Like, oh, <laughs> so sad. <laughs> anyway, not the point of this podcast, but I had to bring that up. Um, okay, so when you're talking about, so I... I've been a member my whole life. I actually only went to girls camp one year and it was my first year and I never went back because I was a ballet student and we always had ballet school and ballet camps during the summer. So I never really got to experience being a youth leader. Um, but I remember as my first year really looking up to those girls and really just thinking that they were so cool and they had it all figured out and that's like what I wanted to be right like the laurels when you're a beehive were like top-notch like yeah. idols right idols yep yeah so anyway, I never got to experience a youth being a youth leader but I thought they were great I never did either Brittany oh, oh come to gosh. think of it I remember going to girls camp but I was never a YCL and I don't know why I think they had just recently like changed. Do you remember how, or maybe it was just like by area, but in my area, the fourth years, like those were the girls that got to go on like the really cool hikes and like the overnight mm -hmm. backpacking trips and stuff. And something changed that year, or it might've been the same year as Trek or something like that. And it like screwed everything up. Oh, don't and bring so up Trek. I never got to do my like big fourth year experience or BYCL. But yeah. now looking back on it, I wonder why. Yeah. So you never had that moment, Erica, of becoming that old man with the gray beard. <laughs> not <laughs> not in young women's, I mean in other areas of life, sure, but yes. not in the girls' camp. I wish I I wish I was the old I was gonna say the old lady with the beard, but I don't want to be the with the beard. Charlotte no. the transition to give her. Charlotte, I I've, I've never been period. When we talk about girls camp, are we talking about the parent trap? Are we talking about church 24 seven with a bunch of girls? Can you explain like what, what, what a typical day is like at girls camp? Yeah, great question. So it's typically up in like away from the community, like in the mountains or in the forest or something. And they just bring in their clothes and some activities and tents and sleeping bags and you sleep in tents or under the stars and then you either are hiking but there's lots of time during the day to do like there's a big craft table usually with all different crafts or a craft shack and there's lots of spiritual there's some great spiritual firesides uh there's like walking through the forest and having you know alone time where you can ponder there's great speakers and firesides the speaker at our last um Girls Camp, she did this activity where you, she was talking about like your self story, the story you tell yourself about yourself and how if it's like, if it's negative, we should change it to positive. And she had girls go up and write negative things on this easel that they think about themselves. 
and then take a Nerf gun and shoot the uh, the next girl who's coming up. And the I, the concept was hurt people, hurt people. So if you work on having a more positive personal narrative, you know, words about yourself, then you will be less likely to hurt others. So, so I mean, there's things like that. There's also, you know, playing in water. It's it's great. It's just a time where girls can, girls from the stake can get away from distractions and just be together and bond and have fun experiences and spiritual experiences. It's awesome. And one of the best experiences you could have at girls camp is snipe hunting. Oh, yes. <laughs> and I don't think that's a thing anymore. But Megan will take you snipe hunting. What is snipe hunting? <laughs> it's a it's like a hazing. I mean, not hazing. <laughs> it's innocent, but it's like it's like an initiation. It's this made up thing called snipes. I think the church actually got rid of it, or at least my stake did, because I think it was considered so. The older hazing. girls take the first years on a hike at night, and they say they're going snipe hunting, and then without the first years knowing there's like older girls hiding in the forest and they'll, as the first years walking by, they'll shake bushes or they'll make noises and, and like they won't <laughs> pop out, but they'll be as if there's these crazy, you know, these creepy animals snipes. in the bushes. <laughs> what in the world? <laughs> Those are snipes. <laughs> you didn't know how cool we were, did you? Before no you joined idea. the church. Yeah, I no had idea. no idea. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So back to the show. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, snipes are very important, very, very relevant. <laughs> Those older girls are learning very important Christ-like qualities during their snipe hunts. <laughs> so, so I loved what you said, Brittany, about when you were younger, you idolized the older girls. Mm -hmm. Yeah, back when, you know, we were beehives and they were laurels. The younger girls idolizing the older girls. So that was totally me. Like, I idolized these older girls. I thought they could do no wrong. They were beautiful. They were talented. They were happy. They were perfect. If they even ever, like, looked at me it just made my week because mm -hmm. I was just little me and they were amazing and when I was 16 I was driving at the time um this is back with three hour church three hours was totally too long and some friends from the ward and I we ditched after sacrament meeting and I took my tithing money from the envelope that I was going to pay that day I opened it up and I took the cash and we went to Burger King bought some food went to a park and we're like, oh my gosh, we're so bad. We're so bad right now. What can we do to not be as bad? And so we sang hymns at the bar <laughs> while eating our Burger King food. <laughs> and then we went back to church because I, you know, my friends didn't drive. I didn't deliver them back to their families. And we went in and our it, young women's advisor came up to us just so shocked. What did you do? Where have you been? Do you realize these younger girls are watching you? They saw you in sacrament meeting. They're seeing you now. They're all aware that you ditched. What were you thinking? Like, she wasn't mad at us. She was just like flabbergasted is the best way that I could describe it. And it hit me then that I now was one of those laurels that I had looked up to when I was younger. And that was my moment of switching from just receiving, like everyone just do stuff for me, entertain me, teach me, serve me, plan my lessons to giver where I realized, okay, they're watching me and what I do matters and so then i started re really reaching out to these younger girls and i talked to them and i compliment them and i had this like photo board a picture board on the side of the women's room and i put pictures of all the young girls up from all our activities and i really tried to reach out to them to like build them up and that's when that's when the gospel changed for me and i just think that it's so important to give youth opportunities to look outside themselves and serve others um, so that they can have those moments too where they switched from being a receiver to a giver. Yeah, especially at a time in your life, teenagers, where you kind of are allowed to be selfish, right? Mm -hmm. There isn't a lot of pushback from the world. It's just kind of expected that teenagers are, you know, I don't know, just yeah, all if about we their expect ego them to and be themselves. Selfish, yeah. right? Right? Then, mm -hmm. then they'll follow that. But if we expect them to be breaking out of their selfishness and start thinking of others and leading others, then they'll rise to that also. Yeah. So that's where I have like two. I don't know. Two thing. Two ways to go about it. I feel like our church is so amazing where we do give opportunities for growth and for leadership to youth to the teenagers. 
And then another part of me is like, why are we giving leadership roles to the teenagers? <laughs> like, I'm like, wow. So I don't know. I have like two parts of it where I can see the good and I can see the direction that we're trying to go. But then there's another part of me where I'm like, they still need guidance. And maybe that's why there are still adults leading them, you know, with kind of more in like a, I don't know, a back way kind of like with the youth now right, instead right. of just like spoon feeding the youth. Definitely. And I think as a church, we're getting so good at that where they're teaching, like my boys and young men's are teaching lessons all the time. Mm -hmm. I like, and advisors are there to advise and just kind of assign out the parts and fill in extra time because there's, you know, often time left over. Their lessons are short. And I think that's so awesome that they get those opportunities to teach. And many youth are like planning and carrying activities. And that's so great. Um, in a ward that we were in, uh, when like Jonah, when they do work council, you know, he'd be in meetings when problems would come up like, oh, this member has a problem. How can we help? What should we do? Or the ward needs this. What can we do? Jonah said, I was just a broken record. I'd always say, okay, which youth can we get to do that? He'd always try and have a youth fulfill the need first so that they could get an opportunity. So I mean like, okay, we need a new chorister. Oh, can a youth do that? Absolutely. I love when youth are choristers. Um, in fact, my friend today was just telling me this great story um, that her son was asked to, he was like 12, to be a, a conduct, to, you know, be the chorister for a stake priesthood meeting. And he was really nervous about it. So they practiced a little bit beforehand and he went and did it and did a great job. And then a few days later, a family from the ward dropped off a conductor's baton on his doorstep and complimented him for being, for doing such a great job conducting. And the mom said that was the neatest thing. Not only that he had that opportunity to serve, like to lead, but then somebody acknowledged it and made a big deal about it. And now he's like excited to conduct and, and to, he realizes that he does have a, good talent that he can share. So giving youth the opportunity to leave, but then also like acknowledge them, acknowledging them when they do a great job is great. And you make a great point, Brittany, about, <laughs> about, um, uh, still, you know, giving them guidelines. Like at Trek last year, Joan and I were ma and pa, and we were told like, don't do anything, let them do everything. And so the first day was a disaster. Like we were just trying to be totally hands off <laughs> and, like packing the handcart was so hard. Meals were so hard. I mean, communication was hard, but, and it was really hard for us to just be silent. And then we talked that night. We're like, okay, I don't, this isn't working. Maybe we can give them some guidance and structure and framework and then they can do it. And sure enough, the second day was so much better when they, when we like gave some ideas, no, said this needs to be done. Who can do it? Helped give assignments. And, you know, have, um, uh, you know, reporting afterwards, accountability afterwards. Yeah. So definitely need some some guidance. But I think like having the idea that when you're in war council and there's a problem, oh, even if a youth doesn't end up doing it, like just have that be a thought. Can a mm -hmm. youth do this? I think that's a great idea because I often wonder if I was born into a family that um, consisted of members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, how would I develop my testimony if my childhood and my teenage years were spent with me being, for lack of a better term, forced to go to church? How, how am I going to create a relationship with Jesus Christ when I really have no say in this? And I think the solution to that is Give me a job to make me feel important. Give me a job to make me feel like I am a part of this larger community and my presence means something. And I think that that would have helped a lot with my testimony versus just being a spectator and seeing adults run the show. Yeah. So I think that's a great idea to look look in the direction of the youth when we need help. Yeah, if there's an activity or start something that like we think we could do a really good job at, like in terms of decorating everything coming together, but, and we give thing like give some responsibilities to the youth and maybe they don't do as good of a job as we thought we could do. We have to remember, it's not about us. Like I'm good. I'm on the giving side of my journey with Jesus Christ right now. It's not about me anymore. 
even if they don't do as good a job as I think, like what's important is what's happening in their soul and in, in their conversion right now. And when we focus on that, then we can look past the imperfections of not having had adults do some things. Yeah. Megan, back to what you were saying. So it was Gordon B. Hinckley, right? A past prophet. He said, every member needs two things, a calling and a friend. And I think that is, it's so applicable. I mean, I know he's a prophet, so his words are always true, right? But it's so applicable because especially today, I think the youth, they do, they need to feel needed. They need to have a calling, a job, a job, and they need um, a friend. And I think, you know, even thinking about the ministering program, Ugh, sometimes that word I'm like oh ministering oh my gosh right because it's kind of cringe right and I feel like we should just be natural about it and just be a friend and I think if there is a youth that's struggling I like that we reach out to the youth and say hey like little nudge nudge maybe you should go you know do you ever see that person at school and try to like plant seeds in their head of oh maybe I can be a friend I can go hang out at their house. I can go invite them to in and out I can go do this. And I think youth help the youth. I think leaders are great, but I think nothing will have more of an impact than having a peer reach out to you. It's true for adults too. Like I, I would want someone to reach out to me if I were new or, you know, so I don't know. I just really think that's awesome for the youth is to give them a job, a calling, and also to encourage them to be a friend and to minister to their peers i also think about did you guys ever have those roommates who like never did anything for themselves and then you're roommates with them and you're like oh my gosh do you know how to like did you ever do your dishes growing up did you ever like clean up after yourselves it was like their parents did everything for them and then when they were your roommate they were horrible did you guys have any of these or like your spouse no i'm kidding (laughs) oh (laughs) Well, I'm kidding, Garnet, I'm I, kidding. <laughs> well, and I think of, I do think of that, like with my kids, sometimes they do something and I'm like, oh gosh, like, thank you so much. But then I have to go behind them and kind of redo it a little bit. Yes. But I always have to remind myself that I'm teaching them how to become productive adults. Yes. And I think of that in the church too, because there are people, there are adults who can't even handle having a calling mm-hmm. and I've had to remind people that have said, I want to be released from this calling because it's too hard. And I am not one to shy away from like, if you're being given a calling and you just, you genuinely think you can't handle it, it's okay to say no. But there is a point where you have to recognize that if everybody doesn't chip in, it's not going to work. And you have to kind of grow up a little bit and be like, oh, I don't really want to do this, but I will because if I don't do this, I'm going to have to do something else. I shouldn't Mm -hmm. say have to do, but be asked to do something else and kind of uh, not play your part, but... um, I like what you're saying. It's like the family unit, you know, like we all have a role to play. Like you have to, like my kids, like you have to put your dirty dishes in the sink and you have to run the dishwasher and you have to do these things in order to keep it functioning. Otherwise, it's, you know, up to one person and it's going to fall apart. Whereas if we're all like putting it in and working together, it's just so much more peaceful and coherent. Well, like what Erica was saying, like sometimes like the concept of it's just easier to do it yourself sometimes, like parents who aren't. And I'm totally guilty of this. It's hard. It's hard. I think women are guilty of it. It would just, well, no guilty (laughs) of like saying it's just easier for me to do it myself. Yeah. Instead of taking so much more time and energy to teach someone to do it like you have to focus begin with the end in mind and go through the difficult times of teaching the children and youth to do hard things so that they are able to and so i think that is like youth leaders we have to remember to to give ourselves more time and patience to train youth um because and not just say it's easier to do it myself and that's why i like that they're starting them young basically because then they'll grow up and just they'll recognize like, okay, this is just my part that I'm willing to do. Yeah. Instead of suddenly you're this adult and thrown into a ward and you have a calling and you're like, oh my gosh, what's happening? So I, I really appreciate it when my kids' teachers tell me like, they're, they're going to start teaching lessons now. I'm like, good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I hope so. Well, and I was talking to the mom today and she said, it's sometimes it's easier for another adult to ask a kid to do something instead of the own parent. 
And so it, church is such a great, um, in, uh, a great, uh, location at environment where other adults are asking your kids to do things so they're less likely to say no i guess if it's not coming from a parent <laughs> yeah, yeah i agree just out of curiosity since you all are moms and you're members of the church of jesus christ of latter-day saints if your children ever first of all have they ever expressed frustration with going to church or participating in a church activity and if they do express that frustration, what's your approach in explaining to them, well, this is good for your personal development, this is good for your relationship with God. How do you how do you encourage your children to enjoy going to church and enjoy being a member of the church? That's a great question. So yeah, sometimes my especially with nine AM church. Okay. That's I mean hard. my my kids really wake hard. up early anyway, but sometimes they just kinda wanna like lounge around and watch shows and just kind of eat their cereal on the couch, right? And they don't really want to get up, get dressed and go to church. It doesn't sound like the most fun thing to them sometimes. Um, and so I acknowledge it. I'm like, just to be honest, sometimes I feel that way, right? <laughs> I'm like, ah! but I tell them like, hey, look, we're gonna go and build our relationship with God. And I think that's beautiful. And also your friends are gonna be there. And so I try to like spin it, not that like it's gonna be a play date, but just like, you're gonna go see your friends. And I think when they're young, I think that's fine. Um, not necessarily like we're gonna go pray and we're gonna go worship, which yes, I understand that's good. But especially in the beginning, it's like make it a safe place for them, make it a place that they want to go where they feel welcome. And I think that's why I love primary. It's because they know they're gonna sing songs, they're gonna see their friends, their teachers are awesome, they're probably gonna bring a treat and it's better than anything mom will make at home. And so they they like going there because it's a place where they feel loved and secure. So that's how I'm approaching it right now. I'm sure as they get older, I'm gonna have different conversations with them and it's gonna evolve into something bigger. But right now it's just church is fun and church is where your friends are and let's start there. Yeah, as primary course director, I definitely try and make primary really fun so that they look forward to coming so that, that when they think about going to church, they at least have that connection that at least I'm going to be having a great time at music time. Um, another thing is that um, I think our attitude about church really passes on to our children. And so if we complain about church in front of them, like then they're going to start looking for the negative things. Also, I know that many years ago when we were in Arizona and it's really hot, and you know, Erica, <laughs> you're in, <laughs> you're in um, Nevada. It's really hot there. And Jonah with like full suit, shoes, tall socks. And I'm in like a cute summer dress, right? We drive home from church and he just be hot, right? And just it's hard to be happy when you're that hot. And he would say like, oh, and this person, you know, this is what happened. And oh, I would have done that. And he just, I mean, you know, the three minute drive home sometimes be kind of negative. And I remember saying one time, like, let's just on that drive home, be positive about church. And then, you know, once you've gotten out of that hot suit, which I'm so sorry you have to wear, <laughs> um, then, then you can like share any frustrations with me, but like, let's not have that be the first thing that our kids hear after church. And so I think that that makes a big difference is how you talk about church and your attitude about church. Also, just the general idea of like, if they say, you know, we don't want to go to church and it's like, well, that's just what we do. It's like when they're young, don't give them the option really like, oh, that's just what we do on Sunday. But then also when they're, you know, realize that, yeah, getting them good sleep on Saturday night, I think <laughs> to help them have a better, just be physically better Sunday morning. But then also there's been so many times where they just say like, I don't want to go to church. The talks are boring. Da -da -da. And I'll say, well, then don't go for yourself today. Go for somebody else today. Who are you going to try and make smile today? Who are you going to try and be friends to today? Help somebody else have a good time at church today. And that just immediately bring, and even if they don't want to hear that at the time, like that is a true Christ-like principle. And like the spirit comes when I say that. Thank you. Okay. So back to youth serving, I was talking with a youth uh, today. I was like, so what are your thoughts about this? What are some opportunities? And he said, and I quote, youth are bad at leading because we have other stuff to do. <laughs> <laughs> and what do you think my response was? So do adults. Yeah. <laughs> we have nothing better to do. Like, no, we're all busy. 
adults, teenagers, we're all busy. We all got, we all got to make time to serve and to lead. Um, and I just wanted to share some really cool things that I think will happen if youth are in charge more at church. So you can pull up some pictures. Imagine how different the sacrament will be with youth in charge. I mean, look at what they would be passing around. Not stale bread, high chews. Uh, <laughs> All yeah. the teenagers around me here are so obsessed with high chews. It was like, that was a thing at girls camp. That's the thing I'm home. We would have high chews at church. That'd be great. <laughs> and then um, I think maybe like once a month, the youth would probably make pajama day for <laughs> church. I mean, look how comfortable those pajamas are. I think that's one of the biggest things that our youth have problems with is just being uncomfortable at church. So they would definitely, if they were put into place of leadership, we'd all have pajama day. Wouldn't that be nice? Um and then this, like, if they're, like, fully in charge, especially the young men, I've got a video clip of just how exciting that might be. Did you just put Lord of the Flies? <laughs> I did. And we can't hear it or see it or anything. Do you, that was so Cardin, traumatizing, Charlotte. Okay. So it's supposed to be from minute one and then just 20 seconds. Oh, so yep. there's not, yep. there's not like stabbing. I, I kind of edited it like it's right oh, the there. Oh, there was stabbing. Okay, so maybe really like, kind of horrific. Actually. Okay, so maybe like 103. Maybe like, I think like that's where he was. <laughs> Okay. That's <laughs> you guys, it's really worth it. It's really worth it. Okay, no, let's no. get to the right part. No, no. Okay, let me so start at hold up, let me look at I'm like, No, I played the right part. It was the stabbing I, ritual. Uh, oh, okay. Start it start it one oh five. Start at 105 and go to like 115. Just 10 seconds. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't do the stabbing. And after 120, there's no stabbing. <laughs> the, the clip that it's showing is just like saying, <laughs> there are the monsters. And then they're all dancing around the fire with like loincloths and painted faces and sticks. Not a traumatic scene. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that one, Charlotte. <laughs> I watched that to like give myself like a little bit of preparation, and I. Sorry, <laughs> what is it's this just about? the dancing? It's just because when boys are in charge, that's what happens, right? It's a joke, guys. We get the joke. We're just laughing, like <laughs> we get it. This is just really funny, Charlotte. Okay. Like this is what would happen if men were in charge, and you have literally feral children slaughtering okay. each other as so an object I, lesson. That's like me walking into elders quorum and literally bringing like gladiator out and saying like, you know, you know, the, what we say now will echo in the eternities and then just showing the head getting lopped off with like Russell Crowe in the sand. <laughs> okay, so Jonah's at Deacon's camp and I called him like an hour ago and said... <laughs> Quick, any more ideas for like funny things that youth are in charge? He's like, oh, I got it for you. <laughs> he sent me this clip. I'm like, this is horrible. And so I just turned it down to the part around the fire where they're dancing. <laughs> you made my day. You made my day. <laughs> so this is what we have to look forward to when we put young men in charge of things. We've got, uh, you know, working together, encouraging each other, coordinating outfits, uh, <laughs> building their own fire, having their own chance. I mean, great skills. That's going to be great in the church if we put <laughs> youth, specifically young men in charge, with no adults to pull them in. I actually, so I was really impressed. Jake and I went to church with one of my friends uh, a few months ago and they are oh gosh I don't remember but um they go to like one of those like big Christian churches and so we we got in there and got settled and she said oh I forgot this is the um this is the Sunday a month where the youth are in charge of worship 
And I was like, oh, okay, that's cool. And it was actually really impressive to see these teenagers get up there and they, um, you know, like the majority of it was you sing and they like were playing like their music. And then the pastor got up there and he gave his little, his sermon, but it was like so short and the rest of it was the music. And like I said, Jake and I, we were so impressed by their talent and just like how well they knew their music. And it was just really fun too, to see the youth do it. And then the funny thing is Jake went to Chick-fil-A like later that week and he recognized the drummer. And he was like, yeah. And he was like, hey, were you drumming at blah, blah, blah church on Sunday? And he said, yeah. And I can't remember the phrase that he used, but I just loved it so much. But he was like, um, he took Jake's order and went through and he's like, all right, man, like praise the Lord. And Jake was like, yeah, (laughs) praise the Lord. (laughs) We'll see you there next Sunday, I guess. Christians at Chick-fil-A. I can't, I don't know if I love anything more. That's great. (laughs) It was like the whole like package of like, he was the drummer at the church on Sunday, working at Chick-fil-A, telling him to praise the Lord on the way out. But I think that sometimes we underestimate what the youth can actually produce. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I've heard of this happening in our own sacrament meetings too. Is having a youth sacrament meeting where they are doing the talks and they're doing the music, and I think that's so great. In fact, I was just thinking, okay, so how can we even get our primary kids leading more? And um, like you all have this in your primary, I know. I'm sure you see this in primary, Megan. I know you're serving primary. The back row is all the kids who are so done with primary and are so ready to enter the youth program. And often they're either like being totally rowdy or just sitting back, you know, with their arms folded, like, get me out of here. So in preparing for this, I was thinking of things that I could do to help those oldest kids in primary lead. Like, can they do the conducting primary? Can they get up and say, this person's going to talk, this person's going to scripture, this is the song we're going to sing. These are the announcements. Can we have one be a greeter at the door? Can even in singing time, like, because I'm chorister, I'm going to call these older kids ahead of time and say, what are your favorite games? What are your favorite songs? Can you lead? Can you literally do the conducting? Can you lead your favorite game? Like, can you bring the treat that we're going to pass out during this game? Like, I am so excited to involve these older kids more for their sake so that they are not bored to tears. They're, la- you know, you know, un happy their last year of primary not bored to years not my primary um and and also that they're already getting ready to be a youth and to serve so yeah what can we do for primary kids so i hope that in the comments oh does anyone have anything else to say i was gonna say up? so when i was a primary kid the, you just like sparked a memory in me that's been very deep down into my brain um <laughs> but uh being a reverence child my ward doesn't do that. I don't. Do your guys' wards do that? Like at the start of sacrament meeting, I've been in wards where you have like that. primary kids just like standing up there, just like folding their arms. Like I, I just started that. Yeah, like our ward doesn't do it. We used to do it all the time when I was a kid, and I thought it was like the biggest honor to a huh. stand on the stage with my arms folded, and I thought I was so cool. And I don't know. I just maybe we need to bring back reverence children. And that was at the beginning of sacrament meeting. As people were yeah. coming in, there as were people t- were coming in. That's that's neat. Yeah, I, I have a I funny story it. about that though. So, um, they texted me about asking my kids if they would do it, mm-hmm. and my older my older two were like, "I'm not doing it." Yeah. <laughs> I was like, "Oh, okay, cool." So we reached that stage. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you you got the junior primary up there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You got to strike while the iron's hot, you know, and you just gotta <laughs> lead them in. Before they're too cool. My son probably think he's too cool to do it too. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Well, thank you so much. It's a great discussion. And please, in the comments, I know a lot of you have great experiences with your own youth, your own children, or youth in your ward, stepping up to serve, to do responsibilities, you know, at church on Sunday after church, uh, for planning activities, for doing things at camp. Like, we want to hear your great experiences. We want to hear your ideas. Let's help this next generation just be so awesome. And uh, for this and more, check us out at wardradio.com.